conductor. I, most of you know that in my class. But anyhow, there might be someone that doesn't. I'll just say that. We have some distinguished guests in the audience tonight. Uh, Donna Barger and the wife of our dean, David Garrison. Uh, then we have Brian Smith up there uh, in the back. And of course, uh, we have my wife over here to the right. And we have <laughs> Brian Parkinson's one of the speakers, and Richard Hall is, is the other. And then all of you are distinguished guests. So welcome to the Third World Perspective. Uh, seminar tonight is going to be on Turkey and this is the first time we've ever had a program on Turkey so it's a first. Meeting in this room is not a first because this is where the Third World Series started on February 18th, 1981 and uh, we had a seminar on major developments in Asia, uh, Latin America um, and the Middle East. Ken Sol, who's uh, Rowan and myself participated in, two of them are retired. And then, of course, we went on and had more seminars, and then that led to the Association of Third World Studies, which some of you are familiar with, the largest professional organization of its kind in the world. It met here, too, in this very room on October 21st, 1983 with two pounds. We're going to have our 27th meeting. Uh, we've grown significantly in Elmina Beach, uh, Ghana, on uh, November 21st to 24th. And, uh, so uh, we're looking forward to that. And um, so uh, there are other things too that are in this brochure which which you have. Sure, I Tonight, uh, I'm going to uh, stop and let the speakers take over. Our first uh, speaker is Dr. Richard C. Hall, who's been here about eight years. Uh, specialist in Eastern European history, Vanderbilt, BA, PH, uh, MA, and PhD from the Ohio State University. Uh, an, an expert on Eastern European history, uh, the author of three books. Uh, the latest is going to be December 2009, published by the University of Kentucky Press, and it's uh, going to be Consumed by War, European Conflict in the 20th Century. So we want to congratulate him on that. That's a great achievement. He teaches a lot of different courses in European history and history, historiography, and uh, he taught history of the Balkans at the uh, GSW May Semester Study Program in Bulgaria, which was a previous program um, uh, this past summer. So uh, what Dr. Hall is going to do is give an overview uh, and background of Turkey. And then Dr. Parkinson will talk about major developments. Temporary Turkey. So please join me in, watch, in uh, welcoming Dr. Richard C. Hall. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. So, uh, what, what he means by an overview is I'm going to tell you the history of Turkey. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we, see his, we see the Turkish people uh, coming into the light of history uh, in the 10th century. They appear uh, somewhere to the east of the Caspian Sea. Where were they before that? Nobody knows. But we start to have written sources for them being in that region. Uh, where there are still Turkish, uh, uh, still four Turkish states today, uh, the, uh, some of the Stan states, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and, and uh, uh, Kazakhstan. Well, one group from this region uh, moved to the west. Well, this is not uncommon. Uh, 
uh, Turkic-speaking peoples had been following the sort of grassy highway uh, north of the Black Sea towards Europe uh, for centuries. Uh, some of them disappeared, uh, intermarried, intermingled with, with other people. Some of them continued to have uh, uh, maintained their own identity. Probably the most uh, obvious in this regard are, are the Medrars, who we call the Hungarians. Now, the particular group uh, associated with the modern Turkish state uh, here, and, 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 and I, I, I really want to think about Turkish history in terms of three great epochs. So I'm talking about the first epoch right now. Uh, beginning uh, sometime uh, towards the end of the 10th or the beginning of the, uh, the end of the 10th century. They move out uh, of this central location uh, in Asia. Uh, these are uh, people who are, are used to animal husbandry. They've got uh, sheep, they've got goats, they've got horses. Uh, but they don't go north of the Black Sea. They take a different route. They go to the south of the Caspian Sea. They go through uh, what was then the Persian state uh, and uh, further on to the east and they become Islamicized. Now interestingly, uh, going through Persia, they did not adopt uh, Shia Muslim, Shia Islam, they adopted Sunni Muslim uh, sect. Uh, and uh, they appear on uh, the frontiers of the Roman Empire uh, in the middle of the 11th century. Now by Roman here, what I mean is that part of the Roman Empire uh, that continued with unbroken uh, continuity uh, after the, in the east, in the eastern part of, uh, of uh, the Mediterranean world, long after the western part of the Roman Empire uh, ceased to exist. The capital of this part of the Roman Empire uh, was at the great imperial city of Constantinople. Now, these Turkish tribesmen are uh, really not, not united of, in, in, by anything other than their uh, avocation uh, uh, and their Islam, they appear on the frontier and in, in one of the great battles of world history, one that what's uh, uh, greatly overlooked, I, I, I doubt if one in a hundred Americans has ever heard of this, the Battle of Manzikert in the year 1071. These Turkish tribes under their leader Alp Arslan defeat the Roman Emperor Romanus IV. And this opens a way for the Turkish tribes to settle in what the Romans had called Asia Minor, what the Turks call Anatolia. Now they, they aren't strong enough, they aren't numerous enough to, to overrun this, this entire region. You see it in the, in the map in the handout. Thank you. This is essentially this, this peninsula between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. But they inhabit the, the arid interior of this region, perfect for their animal husbandry. Uh, the Romans continue to dominate the coastal regions. Uh, and there's going to be intermediate fighting uh, between the, the Turks in the center uh, and the Romans along the periphery uh, for the next couple of hundred years. Uh, these, these Turkish tribesmen are, are never really united. Uh, sometimes they're, they're called the Seljuk Turks, but there's never really a, a unifying force with them. Uh, and and uh, uh, there's a kind of stalemate here uh, until uh, the beginning of the 14th century. Here's where we start our new epoch. The second epoch of Turkish history. At the beginning of the 14th century, the, the Turkish tribal unit uh, in the northwestern part of Anatolia comes under the rule uh, of an individual uh, named Othman. And he will found a dynasty that's come down to us under the name Ottoman. He and his followers uh, are able to uh, rapidly uh, overrun the remnants of the Roman state in Asia Minor, Anatolia. 
uh, by, uh, the, by the end of the 14th century, that is by the end of the 1300s, there are no more Roman holdings uh, in this region. Uh, now, uh, even before that, even before the Roman state uh, is extinguished uh, in Asia Minor slash Anatolia, uh, Ottoman forces, we can say now, the descendants of Ottoman, uh, have crossed across the narrow uh, water barriers into Europe. They've crossed at Gallipoli. Uh, and they uh, begin to, to uh, not only take Roman land uh, in Europe, uh, but they begin to fight uh, some of the other European states, Bulgaria and Serbia. By uh, 1260, or I'm sorry, 1361, the Ottomans have shifted their capital to Europe and into the city that they called Erdini. We call, or in English, it's called Adrianople. Uh, in Slavic, uh, it's called Oldrin. So now they have a European focus. Uh, and they rapidly expand into uh, southeastern Europe. Uh, the reasons for their, their success are complex. Uh, the, the Christian states of southeastern Europe are, are divided, are weak, uh, the Ottoman forces are energetic, uh, strong. Uh, it's also, co their, their success coincides, by the way, uh, with the uh, appearance of the bubonic plague throughout <coughs> Europe, uh, and which kills a third of the European population. This undoubtedly had, had something to do with their success. Well, by 1453, uh, that is, about 100 years after they appear in Europe, they finally take the capital of the Roman Empire, Constantinople. Uh, after a, a, uh, a siege that lasted a month, uh, they kill the last Roman emperor, his name was Constantine XI, uh, and the Sultan, Muhammad II, in effect becomes the new Roman emperor. A new Roman emperor who instead of being Christian is Islamic. A new Roman emperor who, instead of speaking Greek, speaks Turkish. That's about all it changes. Under Muhammad II's successors, uh, further lands are added to this Ottoman Empire. Uh, probably uh, it reaches its uh, high point uh, under Suleiman or Solomon uh, II, known as Solomon the Magnificent, who ruled from 1520 to 1566. Under Solomon, uh, the Ottoman state will control the entire eastern Mediterranean world, stretching from what's today Algeria through Egypt, the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, uh, and on into Europe, including what's now Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, Romania, and Hungary. In fact, uh, Solomon's forces will, uh, in 1529, appear outside the gates of Vienna. That is, right in the, in the center of Europe. Now, they aren't able to take Vienna. But nonetheless, they represented a significant presence now in Europe. The Ottoman Empire is one of the dominant European states. Acting like any other European state, the only difference is it's not a Christian state. Although there's a strong Christian presence. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is more or less tolerant. It does not require conversion. It allows Christians to live under their laws. Now, the Ottoman Empire, however, is not able to maintain this domination. Like any state, okay, it, it inevitably enters a period of decline. Why does it? Well, again, this is complex. One problem was uh, that the hereditary rulers, the descendants of, of Altman, uh, permitted themselves unimaginable luxuries. Uh, they became uh, befuddled uh, by the pleasures uh, that, that absolute power endowed upon them, not the least of which, uh, as you all know, the harem. But that's just part of it. Uh, and they, they lacked the energy, initiative, uh, interest uh, in maintaining their state. But that's just one problem. Probably a, a greater problem than this 
is that the, the Ottomans, with their Islamic basis for their state, their Islamic law, they became increasingly isolated from the uh, developments going on in Western Europe. In other words, the Ottoman Empire doesn't, doesn't, doesn't itself fall behind uh, the Western Europeans because of the scientific revolution, because of the Enlightenment with its focus on logic, reason, the Western Europeans surge ahead. Uh, and uh, this, this surge by the 19th century uh, gives the Western Europeans such things as mass-produced weapons, uh, as steamships, uh, which the Ottomans cannot, they lack the means to produce. By the 19th century then, the Ottoman Empire uh, starts to be known as the sick man of Europe. And the question is, who is going to preside at his funeral? There are plenty of those who want to mourn him, uh, but uh, they can't quite work out an arrangement. And the Ottoman Empire, through the 19th century, uh, founders. By the beginning of the 20th century, uh, its holdings in Europe uh, are confined to just uh, a, a part of, of the Balkan Peninsula. And, and by, the, by 1913, the Balkan states, Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, uh, have, have virtually expelled it from there. So that the Ottomans only cling to a tiny corner of southeastern Europe. Uh, they seek some means to revive. Already in 1908, a group of junior officers in the Ottoman army uh, who were called officially the, uh, the, the Committee for Union and Progress, but are known as the Young Turks, they seize control. And they announce a program of reform. They never managed to really pull it off. Uh, again, the, the, the Balkan Wars of 1912, 1913 inflict further defeats uh, on the once mighty Ottoman army. In fact, Bulgarian, the Bulgarian army will get to within 25 miles of Constantinople before it runs out of gas. So the, the Ottomans clearly have a long way to go with their program of reform. Then comes the First World War. Uh, and the young Turks see this uh, as an opportunity to maybe revive Maybe if we can join the right side, we can, we can, uh, we can get strong. Well, the clever Germans who have two warships uh, in the Mediterranean Sea being chased by the British, seeking some kind of refuge, the, the German warships sail to the Ottoman capital, Constantinople, and ask for help. Uh, and in fact, when they, when they appear in, outside of the capital, the German sailors are all dressed in Ottoman uniforms and complete with the, the Ottoman headgear of a fez. And the Germans uh, announce that they've come to give these warships to the Ottomans. Well, great, now we got two modern battleships. Well, they weren't battleships, actually. Uh, they're the Gulb and, and the Breslau, a, a heavy cruiser uh, and a destroyer. But still, that's great. Better than anything we got. Let's go with the Germans. <laughs> so the Ottomans are once again at war, but they're not prepared for it. Surpri surprisingly, they actually get a victory. When the British and French try to blast their way through the narrow channel of the Mediterranean Sea called the, the Dardanelles to take Constantinople, the Turks hold fast. But elsewhere, they start to falter. Uh, in the far east, a Russian army descends from the Caucasus and, and moves far into Turkey. Now, in this region, in the eastern, eastern part of Anatolia, the population was not Turkish. The population belonged to uh, a, a people unrelated called the Armenians. The Armenians were Christians. Uh, not Roman Catholic Christians, not Orthodox Christians, but they, they were monophysite Christians, an, an old form of Christianity. In fact, the, the Armenians claimed to be the first Christians. We're the first state to ever become Christian. 
Well, as the Russian army approached the, this large uh, Armenian population, the, the officials of the Ottoman army and state in Constantinople panicked. If the Russians get there, we know the Armenians are going to support the Russians. And we know they're going to give them food and shelter, and they're going to help them against our army. We need to make sure those Armenians cannot help our, our enemies. We need to ensure that the Russians, if they get here, will get no aid. So, at, at the beginning of 1915, uh, during the terrible uh, climatological conditions in this part of the world, the Ottoman army forces the Armenian population to leave its homes. Where is it going to go? They're not very sure. They're just going to get them out of the way of the Russians. They drive them down uh, towards the, the extremely arid uh, regions to the south. Uh, and not surprisingly, because this, this movement of the population includes everybody, the very young, the very old, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of them die. Perhaps as many as a million of them die due to the deliberate actions uh, of the Ottoman army. How do we know this? Well, there were American missionaries watching this. There were German missionaries, guys even on the Ottoman side, reporting on this. The, Ottoman po or the Armenian population is decimated. Today, uh, there is, is just a fragment of the Armenian population left uh, in, in an area that at the time was already under Russian control. One of the great acts of genocide of the 20th century, but not the last. In fact, Hitler uh, was uh, said to have observed one time to some of his friends, and as, as he contemplated actions against a different kind of population, he said, oh, who now remembers the Armenians? Well, uh, the Ottoman state by the 1918 uh, was in the throes of defeat. Uh, it surrendered, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say it surrendered, it signed an armistice uh, in October 1918 and left the war. Uh, it's territory was overrun by British, French, and, and Greek forces. And, and by the treaty ending the war with the Ottoman Empire, uh, it was required to cede uh, all, of its, uh, all of its Arabic territory, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, uh, all its territory on the uh, Arabian Peninsula, uh, most of its territory uh, in Europe, and even uh, a part of its territory in Asia Minor, Anatolia. But from the dregs of this defeat, uh, one, uh, one of the uh, young Turk leaders, uh, an army officer who named Mustafa Kemal, began a period of Turkish revival. And here's our third, our third epic of Turkish, era I should say, of Turkish history. Turkish revival. Uh, he rejected the terms of this Treaty of Srevet. Uh, he formed an army in the interior of Anatolia. By the way, he's the officer who was instrumental, or one of them, uh, in the successful uh, defense uh, against the British and the French of, of the Gallipoli Peninsula. Uh, and uh, his army, uh, by 1923, uh, had uh, expelled all the foreigners from Asia Minor, expelled the Greeks. Uh, he marched to Constantinople uh, and got rid of the Sultan, uh, the now decrepit relic from another era, and proclaimed the Turkish Republic. Now, for the first time, we have a real Turkish state. The Ottoman Empire was multinational. The Ottoman Empire always depended on on the services, the taxes, uh, whatever, from, from uh, a multitude of peoples, Greeks, Bulgarians, Arabs, uh, even Armenians, as well as Turks. Now it's just Turkish. To emphasize this, Mustafa Kemal, uh, who had been born in the uh, European city of uh, Salonika, Thessaloniki to the Bible, uh, stolen to the Slav, uh, he 
began a period of, of big reforms to transform the Turkish state. One of the first things he did was he renegotiated the treaty, the Treaty of Luzon now, uh, and he expelled all non-Turks. This meant that uh, over uh, 300,000 Greeks who had been living in Asia Minor, Anatolia, since ancient times were made to leave the country. In return, about 100,000 Muslims from Greece came as refugees. He also moved the capital. The capital had been the ancient Roman imperial city of Constantinople. He said, that's not a Turkish city. We should call it by a Turkish name, Istanbul, simply the city. But we're going to move it to the center of Anatolia, where we began. And he, and he took the uh, city of Angora and renamed it Ankara. Further, he says, we must modernize our state. We must adopt European standards. Along these lines, uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, began, mandated, the writing of the Turkish language, not in the Arabic script, as it had been done up until this time, but in the Latin script. A Latin script modified uh, to accommodate Turkish sounds. He adopted a new constitution for the Turkish Republic, not based upon the laws of Islam, uh, but actually based upon the laws of Switzerland. Totally secular, no religious issue whatsoever. We're going to have separation of church and state here in Turkey. He made women equal to men by law in Turkey. Really, before this happens in the United States, has it happened yet in the United States? I don't know. He further said, we got rid of our Oriental customs. We we got to stop dressing like like Easterners and start dressing like Europeans. This means, men, we need to start wearing pants and, instead of caftans. We need to get rid of the, of the, the conical, cut-off conical hat, the fez. Who wears a fez anymore? And we need to start having last names. Instead, in the past, of being known as, as something like Abdul the Fat Guy, or Abdul the Fat Guy's son, we need to have regular last names. And as an example, he took the name Ataturk, that is the father of the Turks. Now, the big question, and, and I, I suspect uh, Dr. Parkinson is going to address this, is how successful was Ataturk? Did he manage to draw uh, the Turkish people into modernity. Has he succeeded? Is present day Turkey a, a modern European state? Or is it uh, a, a uh, uh, developing state? Uh, there, we have a certain anomaly here. Uh, Turkey is a member of NATO, but not the European Union. There's only one other state that's a member of NATO and not the European Union. That's Iceland. And Iceland has applied to join the European Union. So is Turkey. Uh, Turkey in, in, in Asia, Turkey in, in, in the Eastern or Eastern Mediterranean, though is also an anomaly. It's a non-Arab speaking Islamic state. Will it continue to be a secular state as uh, Mustafa Kemal uh, wanted? Or will it become something else? The current government uh, in the Republic of Turkey uh, is from the Islamic religious party. So there are a lot of questions here uh, about the status uh, of this third epoch uh, of Turkish history. What's going to happen with Turkey? Will it join the European Union? Uh, will it further Islamicize? Uh, and Dr. Parkinson is going to answer all these questions for you. Thank you.
to say a few words about Dr. Parkinson. He, he came here quite good. Uh, in quite 2005 good. and replaced me <laughs> as full-time uh, faculty member. Uh, and, and since then, he really has a distinguished career. Uh, but let me take a little background. He got he went to undergraduate school at Georgia Southern, and then got his MA and P PhD in Middle Eastern history from Florida State University. <coughs> he taught there and uh, in Tallahassee, and uh, he he's an expert on Middle East nationalism and intellectual history. He also is a Fulbright scholar to to South Africa. Uh, what's impressive, uh, what I'm impressed by is the diversity of courses uh, that he teaches. He teaches Asia, Africa, Middle East, uh, world civilization. Uh, uh, I don't know if they asked him to teach American history. He might do it. Who knows? But anyhow, uh, Dr. Parkinson is going to talk about, uh, he's going to respond to Dr. Hall's question and, and also uh, talk about major developments in contemporary Turkey, so please join me. Good evening. I'm going to talk about uh, four major issues that uh, Turkey is dealing with today, and those are accession into the EU, uh, their relationship uh, with Armenia, their historical legacy with Ar uh, related to Armenia, uh, their relationship with Cyprus, and uh, the issues that they have involving the Kurds that are in Turkey. So I'll try and remember to do it in that order. Uh, regarding the EU, uh, Turkey uh, does want to join the EU. They've been attempting to, since about 1999, join the EU. The problem for Turkey is that uh, there are two states that are already EU members that are very adamant that they do not want Turkey to join. And those states are Greece and Cyprus. These are uh, states that have a historical legacy of conflict with Turkey. And so they're not interested in seeing Turkey join the EU. And so, and uh, a little slight corollary to that, there are states in Europe with large Muslim populations that don't want Turkey to join as well. But the two uh, most ardent pro, uh, opponents of Turkey are Greece and Cyprus. Uh, for Turkey to jo join the EU, they have to deal with two issues. Uh, they have to have an economy that is worthy of joining the EU, and they have to deal with human rights issues. Okay. On the economic front, they've made incredible process. And, and if you look at certain economic indicators, Turkey should be able to join the EU according to certain economic indi indicators. They're actually doing what better than certain uh, countries in the EU, like Italy, for example. All right. But uh, the biggest problem that they've had in terms of joining the EU relates to uh, their human rights record. And their human rights record is uh, associated with how they have to deal with the legacy of the Armenian genocide, uh, what they're going to do about women's rights, uh, minority rights, and those minority rights are both uh, religious and ethnic. What do you do about Jews and Christians still living in Turkey as well as what to do about the Kurds living in Turkey. All right, so uh, actually uh, recently the Islamist party that they uh, elected in Turkey, the Islamist party by the way led by Ab Abdullah Gul was elected not because people wanted to move in an Islamic direction in Turkey, but it was really kind of an opposition to the prior secular uh, Ataturk party, which was incompetent and corrupt. And so people have been voting for the Islamist party because the Islamist party actually gets things done and they're not quite as corrupt, even if the population isn't becoming more Islamist. And under, under Abdullah Gul, uh, they have uh, made quite a few positive steps towards joining the EU. Okay, 
All right, let's move on to the issue of Armenia. Uh, the Armenian genocide took, took place in two phases. All right, the, Dr. Hall referenced the second phase during World War I. Uh, the first phase actually took place under a guy named Abdul Hamid II, who was quite the xenophobe, and that took place in the late 1800s. All right. And what's interesting about uh, these uh, episodes of genocide is that the Turks used the Kurds to go after the Armenians. And now, after that problem has been finished, the Turks are themselves going after the Kurds. So it's, it's interesting. All right. Uh, the issue about the Armenian genocide is how do you deal with history? How do you uh, recognize what took place in the past? How do you describe it? And so uh, the Turkish government, whether it was under the Ottomans or whether it's under the new secular state, has been, uh, what's a nice way to put it, very concerned about the use or the word genocide. They want to say things like atrocity or massacre, but they definitely don't want to use the word genocide. As a matter of fact, our Congress a couple years ago tried to pass a resolution describing what took place in these two episodes as a genocide. And Turkey heavily, heavily lobbied the United States not to pass such a resolution. And Turkey does have some sway over American policy because Turkey does belong to NATO, all right? And we have military bases in Turkey and we use those bases to get to the Middle East and Central Asia. The major base that we have in Turkey is in Cyrillic, okay? All right, so they do have, they can make it difficult for us. Turkey can say, you cannot use your air base to go to Iraq. That means we have to go the long way around, which costs a lot more money for us. All right. We never passed that resolution, which upset many Armenian Americans who are quite wealthy and usually live up in the Northeast, like in places like Massachusetts. All right. All right. So, uh, Another thing that's interesting, interesting that re re relates to the Armenian genocide is if you are Turkish or are in Turkey and you do yourself in scholarly articles and publications describe what took place as a genocide, the Turks will charge you with a crime. And that crime is called insulting Turkishness, which sounds like it could be used in a very broad way, a very broad scope or manner. And that it, it is, and that's actually one of the human rights problems that Turkey has to deal with relative to joining the EU is getting rid of that law, which could mean, I mean, could you imagine a law here saying insulting Americanism? Couldn't that be anything? Yes. It's basically whatever the prosecutor wants it to be. All right. So that's that. that I think that's quite interesting. Uh, if you do this, they will bar you from the archives. You can't continue any more historical research, and so on and so forth. Let's move to the issue of Cyprus. Oh, wait. Let me step back one second before we go to Cyprus. Uh, one more uh, issue related to Armenia is Armenia uh, recently invaded neighboring Azerbaijan. And they fought a war with Azerbaijan. And Azerbaijan is, you know, connected to Turkey historically, ethnic, ethnically, linguistically. All right, they are Turkic. If you go to our, uh, Azerbaijan and you speak Turkish to them, they'll reply in Azerbaijani and you'll understand each other perfectly. Okay? They're kin. All right? Well, Armenia invaded a, a region called Nagorno-Karabakh and took it from or occupied it from Azerbaijan. This was a Armenian enclave in Azerbaijan. And Armenia has been loath to relinquish it. They say, look, this is a Armenian area. We want it. And so Turkey has said, okay, well, fine. We won't have any formal diplomatic relations. The most we'll do is have a soccer match together. All right? So it's going to be football diplomacy for now on. Okay? 
All right, and you know what? We were going to build a oil pipeline through Armenia where you can make a little bit of money. Uh, we're going to go around you now, okay? Okay, sorry. So uh, let's move on to Cyprus now. Cyprus is a member of the EU. It's a little island in the eastern Mediterranean. The island is majority Greek-speaking with a minority of Turks, and it breaks down roughly about 70, 75% Greek, uh, 20. 25-30% Turkish, roughly. All right. Well, in the late 60s, there was a military junta in Cyprus, and that military junta sought to overthrow the government of Cyprus in order to become part of Greece proper. All right. And during this period, the Turkish government said, no, I don't think that's a good idea, and so they invaded. They invaded uh, Greece, excuse me, Cyprus in 1974 to make sure that this did not happen. During this period, uh, the Turkish side and the Greek side of Cyprus agreed to an exchange of populations. This is not the first time that they've had an exchange of populations between Greeks and Turks. As uh, Dr. Hall already mentioned, they did this uh, after the Treaty of Lausanne in about 1923 between Turkey and Greece. And so they did do that. And most European governments, most Western governments, recognize the Greek part as a legitimate state. As a matter, matter of fact, it belongs to the EU, but they do not recognize the Turkish part, the minority. And the only government that recognizes the Turkish part is Turkey, yes. Gobble, gobble. All right. So, yes. Uh, so that is one issue that needs to be resolved is how are you going to bring these two populations together for the betterment of the island or are you going to just keep them separate? All right. So we've gone through the EU. We've gone through Armenia, Cyprus, and now let's deal with the Kurds. The Kurds, who are they? Well, the Kurds are the largest population ethnic group in the world that do not have their own state, that do not have their own country, all right? The largest ethnic group in the world without their own country. Uh, they are located in multiple countries. They are in Syria, they are in Iraq, they are in Iran, they are in Turkey. The largest, and they're also in uh, Azerbaijan. The largest group of Kurds is in Turkey. As a matter of fact, of Turkey's 70 odd million people, about 14, 15 percent of Turkey is Kurdish. Okay? The Kurds are Sunni Muslims just like the Turks are, so they have that going for them in, in that they are religiously uh, syncretic. However, they are ethnically different. Kurds are Indo-European peoples and they speak a Indo-European language. That means they're much, much closer related to Europeans. All right? And historically, the Turks have treated the Kurds poorly. They've tried to assimilate them by uh, making sure that you Turkify these people, and in terms of Turkification, what they've tried to do is say, you know what, you cannot use any Kurdish names to name your children. You can only use Turkish names to name your children. Secondly, you can't use the Kurdish language. Not even at home, they don't want you to use the Kurdish language. Okay? They want you to speak Turkish. Okay? So if you are a Kurdish child over in Diyarbakir over in eastern Turkey, and you go to school, are you going to speak your native tongue? No. They are trying to forcibly assimilate you. And if you do otherwise, they'll charge you with insulting Turkishness. That's my favorite of all laws, being sarcastic here. All right. Um, so, but that is also a human rights problem for Turkey relative to joining the EU. So what has Turkey done in order to deal with uh, the Kurdish issue? Well, under the uh, government in place now, they have actually opened up a Kurdish language television program, uh, programming channel for the first time. They're going to also allow 
Kurds to speak Kurdish in Kurdish schools. So what they're trying to do now it, to gain ascension into the EU is they're going to try and give the Kurds a measure of autonomy. All right? After centuries and centuries of uh, subjugating them and trying to assimilate them. Most Kurds by this point, uh, the ones particularly in western Turkey, they've been fully assimilated. They'll say I'm Kurdish, but they might not even know Kurdish. It's only the ones over in the east that still do. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, uh, open it up for questions. Seven fifteen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do either of y'all by any chance know what Turkey's position is concerning northern Cyprus? Because there is increasing demands in northern Cyprus to reunite with southern Cyprus. Now that the uh, rest of Cyprus is doing so well economically compared to uh, northern Cyprus, there is growing demand inside for some kind of resolution. Right. So they can join the European Union too. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, I think there's some dissonance between Turkey and uh, Turkish Cypriots. Uh, Turkey would prefer them to remain separate, and the Turkish Cypriots do want to join the EU. It'd be much better for them because uh, the Greek side of Turkey is much, much more, excuse me, the Greek side of uh, Cyprus is much, much more affluent and well off, and there's a lot of factors relative to education, economics, GDP, and health. Uh, and then the Turkish side. So I think that it's to their benefit to join the EU. But Turkey. Per Turkey doesn't want them to, unless Turkey can get into the EU. Yeah. If Turkey can get in, yeah. yeah one more. One more. I guess I'm assuming that there was some kind of constitution created at the time of Latitude. Yes. Also about the time of the Irish independence, around like 20 years old, which also extended voting rights to women at that time. What has happened to that constitution? Does it still have some? It's had some travails. There was a period of military rule in the 1960s. The constitution's been restored. But uh, even though there were voting rights for women going back to that time, that doesn't mean that women voted. Uh, and the, this process of modernization that Ataturk promoted, uh, while it was relatively successful in Istanbul and, and, and Kara, uh, in the eastern part of the country, largely rural, mountainous, it never has been carried through. Uh, and uh, the traditional ways of life remain uh, remain in place. And, and so uh, what, what's happened uh, at present is uh, many of the traditionalists or the Islamicists uh, are saying, look, the Europeans don't want you. They don't like you because you're Islamic. They call you dirty Turks and so forth. So if we're going to be condemned for being what we are, let's be what we are. And forget about that stuff. And we can never make an arrangement with the Greeks. We're, gonna, we're not going to abandon our brothers uh, in northern Cyprus. After all, we moved a significant number of our people there to stake our claim. After the 1974 invasion, uh, a, a number of Turkish uh, uh, families were settled there because the, the actual numbers of Turks in Cyprus was relatively small uh, to, to enforce the claim. So this is a, a basic tension uh, in Turkey today. I'd like to talk a bit more about women too. I had this image in my head from a bus trip about 35 years ago in the countryside. Uh, all these women working in the fields, it's very hard. Uh, we pulled into the town, and all the men were sitting around in the cafe drinking coffee. And I'm just wondering what. what that I think that's a rural urban dichotomy is what you have. Uh, generally in the countryside, the women receive less education and do more of the hard work. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's more conservative, much, much more conservative and more traditionalist. And so that, that's probably w why you see that urban uh, Turkey is very, and that's also where you see the, the, the difference in uh, who wants to join the EU. It's these urban, educated, secular Turks who want to join the EU. And it's these uh, 
less well-educated uh, traditional Islamist Turks that Dr. Hall was just referring to that are saying, let's just do what we're going to do and what works with us. Yeah. And the swing here is the military. Which way is the military going to go? Now, the military follows the Ataturk tradition, an officer corps, and that's been, that's maintained the balance so far towards the secular side. In fact, the military has on a number of occasions recently threatened to take over the country again if the Islamists get too strong. There have been four uh, military juntas since Ataturk to make sure, ensure that Turkey uh, abides by that secular constitution. I don't, I don't, I don't remember reading anything about that. Uh, Ataturk himself ruled pretty much as a military dictator. Yeah, he was a military guy. And he, there was a token opposition for a while, and then he just said, you know, go home. And I'm going to take care of this. There's a tradition of the military moving in if there's like too much Islamic forces or something like that in the government, rather than something that's actually codified in the constitution. I doubt if it's codified. I don't know. I don't well, know. Turkey does have the most secular or a liberal constitution in the Middle East of any Muslim country. I have to qualify that. Well, we thank you for a wonderful program. Thank you.